All right. Before we get started, I'm going to open us up in prayer. Is that cool? I'm Major, by the way, guys. It's a pleasure to be here tonight to share God's word with you. Um, I come from a recovery ministry my, myself, so before we uh, get started, we always say what brought us to recovery. So I came to recovery for sexual addiction, anger issues, attention seeking, and a whole bunch of, a bunch of other stuff. But I have a new life in Christ. And then y'all say, hey, Major. That's how we do it. Okay, cool. Before we get going, I'm going to open us in prayer. And come on up to the first rows here, because I won't bite, I promise you. But if you would, bow your head. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for your Holy Spirit. Father, thank you that you inhabit the praises of your people. Lord, John 3.30 says, I must decrease so that you would increase. Father, today I pray, Lord, that as I begin to share my message, share my testimony, this teachimony, Father God, that you would just touch my mouth, Lord God, with hot coals, Lord God, so that the words I share, Father God, would be as if you were speaking the very words through me, your servant, Lord God. Now, I'm not a preacher. I have no training, and I don't know how to do a fancy three-point message, but I know that in 2019, I was one way, and today I'm a different way, and that's because of Jesus. So, Father God, you are welcome in this place, Father God. I pray today for fresh anointing on me, Lord God, that as I begin to speak, that these men would begin to fill it in the pit of their stomach, the fire burning, that Holy Spirit fire, that dreams would get ignited today, that these men would have visions, Lord God, that they haven't thought about since they was a little kid because the devil lied, and he tried to kill, steal, and destroy. But Major came today in the name of Jesus to tell them that they have a new life in Christ, and the old has passed away, and the new has come, and you say, behold, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. So I'm here today to expose the lies of the devil because he was a liar from the beginning. But I'm here today to tell them that if they're in Christ, they're a new creation. So, Father, as I begin to open up my heart, Lord God, please let these men receive it, Father God. I must decrease so that you may increase, Father God. I don't want it to be cute. I don't want to tickle their ears, God. I don't want to tickle their ears today, God. I know if I try to do it in major strength, I'm going to sound like a used car salesman. But, Father God, if you anoint me right now, Isaiah 6, 8, send me. Send me, Lord. I'm here today, Father God, to bring the good news. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As I've sought the Lord, the Lord says he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And since 2019, when I ran to recovery, I began to diligently seek the Lord. And he has been a rewarder. And because of that, I've been given a gift every time I go to speak the Lord downloads something to me, and I know what the Holy Spirit sounds like. I know his voice, right? The word of God says, my sheep know my voice, and they hear me. And the Lord has begun to give me this gift of a prophetic message. And so before we get going today, I'm going to do what's called a teach -a I talked to Brian. I said, what do you want me to share on? Because I don't attend here. I don't know where you're at and your journey and your recovery. But he said, just let the Holy Spirit lead you. And I'm like, I can get down with that. I can get down with that. So as I begin to pray and press in, God get, told me something really specific that he wants me to focus on today and how this will, uh, you'll see how my life and my testimony ties into this, but it's that father wound, that father wound and how that father wound can affect us in the things that we do, right? And I got something very specific I need to say today and I'm just going to call this out right now and I don't know exactly who this is for, but I know it's for somebody in this room and God's commandment says to honor your mother and your father. Honor your mother and your father. He doesn't say honor your father if he's a good father and did everything right. He said honor your mother and your father. And you may have a hard time with that and you say, Major, but you don't know what my dad did, man. It's so messed up how he treated me when I was a kid. It may not even be your biological father. It may be a man that raised you. But if he was in the household and he was your father, the Bible says that you have to honor that man. Not if he did everything perfect, not if he did everything right. Because what happens is when we do things not because they feel good, but because Jesus said to do them, there's always a blessing on the other side of it. He's a rewarder. If you seek me, you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. All of your heart. When we begin to seek God with all of our heart, we don't do things anymore because they're comfortable. We don't do things anymore because... It feels good and because it's easy. We do things before because we know the devil's a liar and we know what the word of God says. And if our enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And if the enemy of our soul and the person after, if his main weapon is lies, 
then there's only one way to fight lies. It's with the truth. It's with the truth, with your sword. It's living and active. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It penetrates the soul and spirit. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart and of the man. This is how we fight lies, with the truth. The truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. So young man could be an old man. If you're struggling in your story, if that's part of your backstory, if you're struggling to forgive your father, I'm going to share with you today how I struggled with that through recovery, blaming my father for everything that went wrong in my life, and how in recovery, through the power of confession, forgiveness, and amends. Confession, forgiveness, and amends. How I was able to disarm and defeat the evil one. See, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4, says the weapons we fight with have divine power. Divine power for pulling down strongholds. Somebody say divine power. Divine power, divine power right? See, 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 1.18 says the message of the cross is foolishness to those that are perishing, but to us that are being saved, it's the message of power. Say power. power. 1 Corinthians 4.20 says the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but a matter of? Power. Come on, y'all. It's the third time. You got to get it right this time. <laughs> For the kingdom of God is not a message of talk, but a message of power. Power. Right? We have power. He does not leave us helpless in this battle. We have divine power for pulling down strongholds. Now, forgive me for not knowing everything about bold and how you guys operate, but do you guys do inventory? Do, do you take an inventory? You guys take inventories? Take a note of this. If you've got a pen and pad, write this down. Write this down. Brothers overcoming lustful desires, right? That's what bold stands for? Okay. All right. Y'all want to get set free from that? Yes, sir. It ain't going to be because anything I do. It's going to be because what the Father says to do. You get on board with that? Okay. Rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. All right. Here's what I want you to write down. Harm's done by me. Harm's done to me. Fears. Resentments and sexual. Harm's done to me. Harm's done by me. Fears, resentments, and sexual. That's five categories. And you can do this on your own. You don't have to go through a, a one-year course to, 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 to receive the message I'm giving tonight. Okay? So those five categories. What I want you to do is over the, next, the course of the next six to eight weeks, I want you to begin, begin to fill in those things for the, your entire life. Your entire life. I want you to inventory that stuff. If you have Jesus, if you have not accepted Christ yet as your Lord and Savior, I do not want you to do that. Understand me. I don't want you digging up anything and pulling up anything if you don't already have Christ as your Savior, okay? Because if you have Christ as your Savior, when you get all that on paper, you're going to understand that all that stuff that you're going to write out, that's exactly what our Savior nailed to the cross with Him. You understand? But if you don't have that power for the message of the cross is foolishness to those that are perishing, but us that are being saved, it's a message of power. If you don't have that power, I don't want you to do this yet. I want you to come see me after this when I do an altar call. And I want you to Accept Christ tonight if you feel the Holy Spirit putting that on your heart. And then maybe, and then you can do that. But if you're not, I do not want you to do that. So I'm going to continue. Okay, so. I want you to map all that out. Then I want you to figure out who in your life is an older, more mature Christian. An older, more mature Christian in your life. And I want you to take that with him. And I want you to confess everything on that. Everything on that. Okay? You guys ever know, uh, heard about how high grasshoppers can jump? Grasshoppers can jump 30 inches. 30 inches. 
the equivalent of you as a human being able to jump that, that many times your body length would be you taking one jump and jumping an entire football field. Did you know that? That's the equivalent of you going boop and you're in the end zone. That's the equivalent. If you take grasshoppers and you put them in a six inch mason jar and you put a lid on and they live in that mason jar for a week and they jump and they hit their head. 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 And they do that for a week. Guess what happens when you take the lid off? Do you think they jump out? They can jump 30 inches. Do you think they jump out? No, they don't. They stay jumping six inches. You know why that is? Because they learned. They got conditioned because they hit their head so many times. They got conditioned to believe a lie. See, he's the author of lies. And John 8, says, when he lies, he speaks in his native language, for he was a liar from the beginning. Who told you you were naked? Who told you you were naked? They went and hid themselves, right? They went and hid themselves in the garden. When that's when John 8, says he lied from the beginning, that's the first thing he did. He said, who told you you were naked? And so just like those grasshoppers, we begin to believe that we can only jump six inches high. And when that lid comes off that mason jar, those grasshoppers, you don't have to worry about keeping the lid on the jar because they're trained that they can only jump six inches. I heard another story recently, which is really cool. A buddy of mine in Bible study on Thursday, his name's Doug. He starts telling a story. Him and his wife, they had a storage unit. And, over, and he's had the storage unit for years. And over time, the door, it became really, really heavy and jacked up. And any time you would open that door, you would have to really tug and pull and lift it and do one of these things where you pull it out, and then you pull it in, and then you push. And that was how you got the door up. And they did that for years. And so one day he was like, you know what, we need to get a new door for that storage unit. So the repairman comes and he says, what kind of a door do you want? How do you want the lock to operate? What kind of door do you want on this? And he says, well, my wife sometimes go to the storage unit without me. I'd like to have one with two fingers that she can just lift and open and close the door with just two fingers for a woman. And the repair guy goes, okay, yeah, we can do that. So he puts on the new door. And for a year straight, he had to break himself of the habit because he had a brand new door that he, his wife could just do with two fingers. But he had done it for so long, he was the brand new door. He was going. <laughs> you can't put new wine in old wineskins. Behold, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away. The new has come. We're no longer identified by what we did in the past. We're no longer identified by what our daddies did to us or what our daddies didn't to us or the mistakes that we made or our 40 time or our wrestling scholarship like I thought. We're no longer identified by the good things that we've done, the achievements we've made in this world, which God calls all vanity, vanity under the sun. And we're also not identified by the things that happened to us, the sin struggles, the pornography we can't escape, the things in our life that we don't want anymore. Apostle Paul wrote one third of the New Testament and he said, I have the desire to do what is right but not the ability to carry it out but you think you got to be perfect except Jesus's love <laughs> recovery is not about behavior modification man it's not about behavior modification Paul said I prayed three times for God to take this thing away he said my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore, all the more gladly, I boast about my weakness. I boast about my weakness because when I'm weak, then he is strong. Then he is strong. Then he is strong. If you ever notice a computer, if your computer's slow, right? First thing they tell you is to look in the background and see what windows are open. Because when the computer's malfunctioning, not running smooth, there's usually things running in the background. Right? And sometimes when things run in the background for so long, you don't even know it, you get a virus in the system. And then you got to run a virus check. And then sometimes this thing pops up and you're like, this thing's living on my computer? How'd that get on my computer? I don't even know. <laughs> Maybe you were looking at porn. I don't know. But how'd that virus get on the system? You weren't even aware of it because it was running in the background. It was running in the background. 
And that's why it's important to take an inventory of your life. To take an inventory of your life. Because you got things in the background. How many of y'all, be honest, men, be honest. How many of y'all have ever been driving down the road, somebody cuts you off, next thing you know you're ticked off and you're giving them the middle finger out the one? Right? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Just because it's church, we're going to be like, yeah, man, I'm good, everything's great. That's how church was when I grew up, man. That ain't how we do church. Bro, I'm struggling with this, I messed up here, I did this, I yelled at my wife last night, I told my kid he was fat, whatever. We got to confess it. We got to confess it, because it says the weapons we fight with have divine power. Confession is a weapon. When we talk about weapons and this being a sword, most people think prayer, and prayer is a strong weapon. But it ain't the only thing we're armed with, man. we got to put on the full armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of peace, that we may be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. The wiles of the devil. So many people, they think, man, if I go to church, life's going to be great. I'm going to have my big house and my big car and live my best life now, and that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. It's in Christ that we can do all things. It's in Christ that all things work together for the good, for those who love the Lord. For those who love the Lord. So I got to recovery, man, as I said before. I've not looked at pornography since 2019. I have not hit on a woman in a bar since February of 2020. When I was halfway through recovery, I met my wife doing jujitsu at the gym where I coach wrestling. I am now married to her. We got married on January 23rd. She made it one, two, three, so I would never forget because I'm a dude. You know, we forget stuff. Can't forget one, two, three. Right? In Ephesians 3.20, it says he's able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we can ask, think, or imagine. Right? Matthew 6.33 says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. My wife is that and then part. Honey, if you're watching this, this is for you. <laughs> and then everything else will be added unto you. Everything else. Right? Everything else. Everything else. One woman that will satisfy you in a way that nothing in the world can. See, when we look at pornography, we're chasing something. We think that it's going to fulfill us because really there's some, something running in the background. There's something in the system. There's a virus in the system. There's something going on that we haven't exposed yet. John 1.5 says that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. So when we come to church and we begin to live in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Because my Bible says if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship with him. And I want to have fellowship with the creator of my soul, the one who loves me, the one who laid his life down for me. The one who says that I am a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Woo! Special possession. Who told you you were naked? Who told you you were naked? Who told you that's how you're always going to be? You're just going to always struggle with porn. You're just going to always struggle with sexual immorality. You're just going to always struggle with this stuff. Who told you you were naked? Jesus says he was pierced for our transgressions. That's our outer sins, things we commit ourselves directly. But he says he was bruised for our iniquities. A lot of people don't understand or know what an, an iniquity is. An iniquity is a natural twistedness that exists in us from a lifetime of sinful choices. Sometimes from sins that we inherited from our forefathers, a.k.a. generational curses. You ever notice if one man struggles with divorce, then his son struggles with divorce? The Bible says the son can only do what he sees the father doing. But, you know, this is just how Dodge men are, man. I mean, we're all womanizers. I mean, you know, we all have three or four. It's just how we are, man. We all think we're good looking and God's good. And we just, you know, it's just how we are. Who told you you were naked, bro? Firestarter, would you give me a water real quick, please? <laughs> This one. I'm dehydrated because I was crying for an hour and a half before coming to this today, praying in the tongues, praying in the spirit. Is this a Baptist church? No. That's cool. Oh, okay. I can say tongues and not be like a weird thing. Everyone think I'm weird? Okay, good. Huh? Okay, cool. Everyone should just because it's in the Bible. 
I don't believe part of it. I believe all of it. That's an amen, right? But look, I don't want to get fancy up here and try to put on a presentation. I fight with that because I am an actor. And I'm not here to put on a presentation, man. I'm not here to, like, make this cute and cool. I'm here to tell you that I was one way in 2019, and now I'm another way in 2022. And that's because I understood what my weapons are. And I understood that instead of hiding sin and going to church and be like, man, everything's great, I began to get with a group of men that would hold me accountable. And I could tell them the truth of what I was really going on. And then consistently being in the light and consistently being in the light, consistently being in the light, consistently being in the light. And then guess what happened? James 5.16 says, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be what? Say it out loud. Healed. Healed. See, I ran away from this as a kid because the gospel came into my life because there were some praying women. There wasn't no men of God in my life. There were some praying women who were planting seeds, right? But I looked at this because some of those same, same praying women was like, if you don't stop doing that, boy, you're going to hell. And I was like, well, dang, I don't. I can't stop listening to gangster rap, man. I love Biggie and Pac and Dre. I can't. But Jesus, as I began to read his word, he said, come just as you are. He didn't say go get cleaned up first and then come to me. But I had people in my life and I'm not here to knock them, but I looked at this as a rule book. And because I knew I couldn't do everything and it said right away, I thought when I accepted Christ at that revival, at that youth camp at 17 years old, that a miracle would take place and I just wouldn't do any of that stuff anymore. Miracles are instant. And I believe in miracles, signs, and wonders. But healings take place too. And you know the difference between a healing and a miracle? Healings take time. Isaiah 28, 13 says, line upon line, precept after precept. Romans 12, 2 says, no longer conforming to the patterns of this world, but instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Only way to get a renewed mind is to start reading the word of God. We don't have burning bush experiences anymore. God doesn't necessarily speak like that. People say, how can I believe that God don't talk to me? You got to open his word. He speaks to me every single day. Every single day. Some of y'all struggling with stuff and you only talk to him on Sunday. Who's married? Raise your hand if you're married. What happens if you talk to your wife only on Sunday? What's your marriage like? You ain't going to be married. You ain't going to be married. Jesus is selfish. He wants you every single day. He desires a relationship from you, not a religion. Not a religion. But some of us, we get saved and we come to Christ and we think, okay, and then we can't do it all. And then we're going back and we're right. The very evidence that you're struggling and you don't feel good anymore watching pornography, young man, is because the Holy Spirit lives in you. Because before you had the Holy Spirit living in you, you'd been cool doing that stuff in the dark and not worrying about it. That's the very evidence that you are a changed creation, a new creation. Acts 2.38 says, repent and be baptized and then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit. This isn't a rule book. It's a love letter. It's a love letter. It's a love letter that you can then, it also functions as a sword. Take that devil. I love it. I don't even call it my Bible anymore. I call it my sword. Pastor Beto, we was at that, uh, where's Brian at? Pastor Beto, I loved it. He got up there and he goes, let me look at my sword. I was like, yeah, that's what I call it too. I don't even call it my Bible anymore. I call it my sword. Forgive me, I chase squirrels sometimes when I'm preaching, but that's because, man, I just get so excited. When you get true change in your life and you've been in bondage to something for so long and you finally get set free from it, you can't help but go tell people. And I have to. And I have to. And you need to make, you don't have, I'm not a pastor, dude, I'm an actor, but you need to make a regular habit of doing this. Because Revelation 12, 11 says they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Right. I'm up here trying to tell somebody today. I'm up here trying to tell somebody today about how Jesus can set them free. Do y'all want to get free? Y'all want to get free from the sin that enslaves? Let me read something to you. This is Ephesians 4.18. You must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. 
They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. I'm going to continue. I had this bookmarked. There we go. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Do not grieve the spirit. Therefore, put away lying. Let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Whoo! Man, that was my life. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, what is good that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit. See, when you go on sinning, the Bible says that him who know not what to do, know what to do, and, don't, and they don't do it, to him that is sin. And when you continue to go down that path and just believe that lie, this is just how I am, you grieve the Holy Spirit. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put part away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted. Forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you. So back on track. So once you do your inventory, I want you to confess it. When you pick out the person you confess your inventory to, it should be a person that's a more mature Christian, somebody in your life that you trust. You don't have to confess it to everyone. And I want to be very specific here about something. The 5% that you don't want to tell anyone about. The 5% that you've never told anyone about. That is exactly where you need to start. Exactly where you need to start. If you're a tough masculine dude and you've struggled with homosexuality, you start right there. If you stole, cheated, Murdered and something that you think is a big sin, there's no big sins. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, no sin temptation exists except for that which is common to man. Common to man. And where temptation exists, God is faithful and always provides a way out. The devil wants a lie. Who told you you were naked? If you confess that, if you tell somebody that, I mean, dude, they won't. That's weird that you did that. That's weird that that happened to you. That's exactly where bondage stays, man. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. When you expose that stuff that you're in bondage to, those strongholds, and you draw a line in the sand and you say, I'm stepping in right now. I'm standing in the gap for my children, for my children's children. No longer will be identified as womanizers. No longer will be identified as porn addicts. No longer will be identified as people that always get divorced or, or men that always go to jail. No longer will be identified by that. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, the old has passed away and the new has come. I'm talking about identity. And that stuff that you did when no one was looking, that stuff that you did that you never told anyone about, that is exactly where you need to start if you want true freedom. Expose it to the light. 
1 John 1, 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to cleanse us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I don't know what it is about that word all, but it's my second word in the Bible currently after Jesus. It's, like my, it's my second favorite word. All. It's finite. It's finished. All. I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. All things work together for the good. Whew, I love that word all. So we confess it. And then we hold hands with that brother across from us. Or if you choose to come here in bold and confess it to everybody, you hold hands with everybody and then you pray. And then guess what happens after you pray? You're healed from it. You're healed from it. Does that mean that, that, that the devil's not going to stop trying to tempt you? He may or may, may not. But you're healed from it. Birds fly over your head, but you don't let them make a nest there anymore. You draw the line in the sand. And what's going to happen when you confess that stuff that you've been carrying around, when you close those windows in the background of your operating system that, that you didn't even know were running, that have been slowing you down, those things that are underneath the surface that cause you to flip the dude off in traffic who cuts you off, it ain't about that guy. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places, against evil principalities. That's why we put on the full armor of God. Why am I pumped up? I ain't up here trying to put on a show, but I know there's a devil after you and he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus said, I come to give him life and life more abundantly. And if you don't know you're in a fight, you're getting your tail kicked. Because you can't even fight if you don't know that you're in a fight. And you men are in a fight right now. This entire world wants to put a label on you. LGBTQ, she, him, pronouns, Republican, Democrat, yellow, red elephant, uh, blue donkey, whatever else. They want to put something on you, tells you who you are. You ain't identified anything except for a bloodstained cross. That's who you are. So we confess those things. And then all those harms done to us and those resentments after confession is forgiveness. We forgive those people. Right? I was really good about confessing my own sin, I'll be honest with you, for the most part, there were a couple I never told anybody, and I got so much freedom when I told those. I was, I was pretty good overall about confessing my own sin. My struggle was, I had a hard time confessing the sins done to me. The harm's done to me. My daddy was a Vietnam vet, man. He had PTSD. They called it shell shock back then. They, did, they didn't even have like a, a scientific term for it. Just He's got shell shock, right? And man, he, my, my whole childhood, dude, he was just violent, right? Many nights I'd wake up, he, I saw him throw beer in my mom's face. One time, grab her by her hair, drag her through the front yard. Uh, another time, I'm eight years old. My, and I, so I say this now, I'm not promoting sin, bro. I'm just telling you I'm free from it now. It's not a, it does, I'm not captive to it anymore. So I tell this, bro, I'm not ashamed of anything anymore, bro, because my identity is in Christ and Christ alone, okay? But this is my backstory, And, you know, so my dad's on top of my mom. And she's screaming, help, help. He's going to kill me. He's going to kill me. And I run in there and slide in between him. I bite my dad on the neck. I'm like, get off my mama. I made a decision at eight years old that night. When I get married, it's going to be forever. I'm going to marry one woman, be faithful, and I'm not going to be like him. 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 My wife now is my second wife. My first marriage was tumultuous because I had everything wrong modeled. I was a Christian, but I wasn't following Christ. I wasn't following Christ. Because when I made that moment in, 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 in high school, I was faced with a decision. I was told I had a calling on my life, and I was like, I don't know what to do with that. There's no men in my life. I had no brothers. I had no Christian man in my life. My mom was praying for me, and God bless her, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for her. But I ran from it. Because my identity, because of the abuse of childhood, because of the bullies, and I'm not going to share that story today for the sake of time, but I had some bully situation and different things happened, and words spoke over me by the cool kid who told me, you're never going to be anything, you're a loser. We'd never be friends with a loser like you. These lies that I began to believe and accept over me, I never told anyone about 
I never told anyone about the stuff my dad did. I never told anyone about what those bullies did to me when I was 12 years old. Wow. Ever. And those words they spoke over me. Those windows were running in the background. And my computer system was all malfunctioned. And there were viruses. But I got to inventory all that stuff out. And then I began to forgive those people. And not because it was easy, not because it was comfortable, but only for one reason. I believe what God said. I believe what God said. He said, in the same measure you forgive, that'll be measured back to you. He said, give and it shall be given to you. Come on, Luke 638, preach. That's right. <laughs> he said, to whom much is given, much is required. Right. We all know about the woman at the well, right? And we know about the other lady when Jesus said, whoever's without sin, be let them cast the first stone, right? Been in church for at least two weeks, you heard that story. But we forgive. We forgive those trespasses. We forgive those things. And if you've ever seen anybody on a, weight lo on a weight loss journey, this is what it's like. Because I went through recovery, and then I led a group of men through recovery. And then after I led a group of men, then I, I launched with uh, some, a couple other guys the pilot program for teenage regen, regeneration, which is why my brother Isaiah is here. He's one of the teens that's in my, in my uh, recovery course I'm leading right now. But we believe what God says. He says the light shines in the darkness. And then it seems tough, right? You're like, ah, I don't understand it. Well, Proverbs 3, 4, 5, and 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And my favorite part of that, lean not on your own understanding. How many times as men do we try to figure things out in our mind? You can't possibly ration. It said the scripture says we're all looking through a stained glass window. You can't possibly understand all the... the uh, majestic and beautiful uh, things of God. There was a cooler word I was thinking for, but I didn't get it. But your mind, your, no, no mind can comprehend, right? No mind can comprehend it. So we lean not on our understanding and we do that. If any of y'all watch Cobra Kai, I was on season two of Cobra Kai, right? And so, but I think back to Karate Kid, and in the Karate Kid, Mr. Miyagi, Daniel trusts Mr. Miyagi. He just trusts him. He doesn't understand everything Miyagi's telling him to do. So Miyagi brings him out to his property, and he says, wash and wax these cars. And he's washing and waxing these cars, and Daniel can't figure out why he's doing it. Paint the fence. He's like, Miyagi, why do I got to paint the fence? And he, he grunts, and he's frustrated, and he's upset, and he kicks the paint can in one, in one scene, and he doesn't want to do it. And then he gets in the war. He gets in the fight. <laughs> And Miyagi says, wax on, wax off, paint the fence. And all of a sudden he's like, yes, yes, yes. In his mind he's knowing, that's why I trusted you when it didn't make sense. I trusted you when it didn't feel right. I trusted you when I was being lied to. I didn't know it didn't feel good. It didn't feel right. I didn't want to do it. I was begrudgingly, but I did it anyway because I trust you, Mr. Miyagi. I trust you, Jesus. I do what the word says. When you get in a fight, you understand why you're doing these things. There's an enemy after your soul. And he wants to kill, steal, and destroy. That should do something inside of you as a man. The battle's already been won, though. It's already won. In the end, we know how this story plays out. Inventory, confess it, forgive, and then I want you to make amends with as many people that you hurt and that hurt you. I want you to make amends with many people. And don't get all confused here into how you do this, right? Just take a piece of paper and start writing it all out. And things will come to you over time. And you may not get everybody right away. But start with the hard stuff first, the thing that you would never tell anybody that happened to you or that you did. Close those windows so your system starts running well again. You understand? Start with the hard stuff. 
But once you confess it, you forgive, I want you to seek out amends. Now let me tell you what an amends is. Actually, before I tell you what an amends is, let me tell you what an amends is not. An amends is not this. Hey, Dad, uh, look, man, I'm doing this recovery thing. You know, I'm with Bold, and, uh, you know, we're trying to get over our lustful desires and everything. And, uh, look, uh, I'm just calling to tell you that, uh, you know, all that stuff I did, you know how I stole your car and I wrecked it and then I took the money from you and da-da-da-da. You know, man, I would never would have done any of that if you hadn't done this, 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 and that. I'm just saying. The reason I did that is because you did this. That's not what an amends looks like. Okay? Brian, am I good on time? What an amends looks like is this. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Look. Father, I know, Lord God, your yoke is light, your burden is easy. Father, I know, Lord God, that you're in this. I trust you, Lord. Lord, it doesn't seem right. It doesn't feel right. I don't want to do this, Lord. But you say lean not on your understanding. Lord, you say in Isaiah, Isaiah 55 that your ways are higher than my ways, Lord God. And so I, this doesn't feel right, but I know it. the Bible says that I need to do it. The Bible says I need to forgive. The Bible says I need to reconcile. The Bible says I need to, to be regenerated. The Bible says that my, my heart needs a surgeon and his name is Jesus. And this doesn't feel right. But that crazy actor on stage, he told me he did it and he got freedom and his relationship with his daddy got restored. And I I really want that so I'm gonna do it and then you pray Jesus help me Jesus help me and then you pick up the phone and it sounds something like this hey dad this is a true story this is mine okay dad uh, look uh, I'm in this this 12-step Christ-centered discipleship program and uh, it's called regeneration and uh, um, I'm on this eighth uh, seventh step now it's called a amends and uh, I just part of my recovery and my healing is to call you up and ask for your forgiveness for all the things that I did I want you to know in 2010 when I was going through my divorce and I want you to know that you know when we that me and and, and, and her when we had that fight and you know and she was throwing things at me and I put my my hands around her neck I just, I'm learning to confess everything I did, every single thing, Lord, uh, Dad. And uh, I just want you to know that I don't blame you for anything. And uh, I want you to know that I, I don't blame you for anything, but I need you to understand that I'm doing this list called resentments. And I had a lot of resentments uh, towards you. And I'm not here to point out anything that you did, but uh, I'm here to point out the harms done by me. And uh, I want you to know that in 2010, when I was going through my divorce, I was filled with so much angry. And since we have the same name, Dad, and I have your social security number memorized, I went to the Sears in Rockwall, right next to the Brookshires, and I bought three flat screen TVs in your name. And I tried to screw your credit up on purpose. I did that in 2010, not because I couldn't afford it, but because I was filled with angry. I was, I was filled with anger, and I'm just so sorry. And I want you to know I love you and you're my dad. And I please, would you please forgive me? I didn't, I'm not filled with anger now. And Jesus is doing something inside of my heart. And this doesn't feel right, but, but I just know I need to do it. And then you sit and you wait. And then one or two things happen. And praise God, I was lucky for what happened. But this may not happen, and it may happen over time. Reconciliation. And making amends with somebody doesn't mean that you're being reconciled to them. Okay? It doesn't mean you're necessarily being reconciled to them. Reconciliation may come, but typically it's later. Okay? Lucky for me, reconciliation was made right on the phone. And for a man that I blame for everything, for a man that when I was going through my divorce, I blamed my dad because I was like, I didn't want to turn out like you and look, and I didn't want to end up like you, and I never thought I'd ever put my hands on a woman. And when she was throwing that stuff at me and she was drunk, I put my hands on her neck. I didn't squeeze, but my hands went on her neck. You don't ever put your hands on a woman, but I did it. But now all the more gladly I boast about my weakness because then I'm weak, then he is strong. I no longer hide sin. I no longer polish the bowl on the outside when the bowl's in dirty and I come to church and tell everybody everything's great. I'm with a group of men and we consistently hold each other accountable and we tell each other what we're going through and we pray for each other and we expose things. And because of that, we grow in the things of God. I'll never forget when I moved to Texas. Y'all got some funky grass here. It's called crabgrass. I grew up in Indiana, Kentucky. We have bluegrass. It's pretty. I didn't like this stuff here. 
But the guy came to my house and he's telling me all the stuff he's going to do to my yard to fertilize it and make it strong. And I was like, that's cool, man. I was like, well, what do you do about all those weeds? Do you pull those out? And he's like, no. We just strengthen the good grass. And as a natural result of the good grass getting stronger, it just pushes the weeds out. That's what happens when we create new habits. Recovery programs don't work because there's this cool curriculum. Recovery programs work because it forces you to do James 1.22, which says, do not merely hear the word and deceive yourselves, but do what it says. The Bible says to confess. The Bible says to make amends. The Bible says to forgive. Do not merely deceive yourselves and be a hearer of the word, but do what it says. So when we actively go out to go through the pain of digging up an inventory, writing all this stuff out, uh, confessing it to somebody else, stuff we don't want anybody to know, confessing it, closing those windows, right? Making amends. Seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. The, reward is a, the Lord is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. The way you begin to diligently seek the Lord is by doing what His Word says, by doing what the Bible says. Not going to church on Sunday, hearing a great message, and then going on Monday and going back to doing what you want. The Bible says when we do that, we're like a man that goes to the mirror, sees his face, turns around, and then immediately has to go back to the mirror because he forgot what his face looked like. So we make amends. And if anybody's ever been on a weight loss journey, you know how they take the picture on day one? <laughs> and then they show you the picture at day 365? I cannot tell you. When I was going through recovery, I didn't see it. It's the same way when you're losing weight. When you go through it and you're working out and you're eating right, you don't notice it. But then people that see you, and they see a couple months later, and then they see you a year later, and they go, dude, what happened to you? I lost weight. I started living for Jesus. It's what it's like. That baggage, it's like a weight comes off your shoulders. Weights come off your shoulders. And the next thing you know, the dude, the dude in, the par- in, the, in, the, in the grocery store parking lot that tries to go for your parking spot, and all of a sudden, instead of giving the finger, you go, hey, dude, Jesus loves you. Woo! It's real change. You don't have to be a slave anymore to sin. It's real change. That's not to say that you won't struggle with things from time to time, but when you do, you run to your bros and you're like, hey man, listen, I'm struggling with this. You call 911 on your phone. Hey dude, I'm feeling about, to, I'm, I might to watch porn. Okay, brother, well I'm here, I'm going to pray for you right now because the, the Bible says that I can put, if one can put a thousand to fight, two put ten thousand to fight. And we're going to come together in agreement in prayer and we're going to pray and I'm going to cast out those demons because in Mark it says that he leaves the Holy Spirit with us and now we have power. And the, Mar- and the Bible says that greater things will I do in Jesus' name than what he did. And he cast out diamond, uh, demons and he put hands on the sick and they got better. And he made the blind see. So if the Bible says that I can do greater things, I'm going to come in agreement with prayer on the phone and we're going to believe. Mark 7, 14 says, believe whatever you ask in prayer and it will be done for you. We're going to believe. And then this is what you're going to do. You're going to put reckless love of God on right now and blast it. Because it's impossible to masturbate with reckless love of God plan. Can't say I've tried it. But I know it's impossible because the thought of it, bro, trips me out. <laughs> Woo! So there's a long pause. And then my dad goes, well, that's okay. I ain't mad at you. You're my son. I love you. And a man who used to tell me that Jesus was like Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny showed me more Christ in that moment. A man who doesn't even know, I don't even know if he has Christ yet, but I'm praying and believing. And, I, there's some, and there's more to this story, but in that moment, he showed, my daddy showed me more Jesus than half the people in the church I grew up in showed me. It's okay, you're my son, I love you. And I began to weep. And in that moment, all that stuff that he did, when, when my parents got divorced and on my birthday he bought the stripper's kid the same mongoose that I begged him for and couldn't get until he divorced my mom. All the stuff that he did, all the nights where I woke up and he was beating my mom, all those things that I used to hate him for, all of a sudden they just went... One conversation. To whom much is given, much is required. And I let him off the hook because God's let me off the hook. (laughs) 
And I got my daddy back in that phone call. And then me and little major, my son, we go to my dad's house in the middle of COVID after I've already finished my recovery. And I'm leading another group of men through recovery. And we go to my dad's house and we're there. My dad gets a phone call and I'll never forget this. I'll never forget this for the rest of my life. He gets a phone call. He hangs up the phone. He goes, well, that was your Aunt Debbie. Uh, her and your Aunt Roseanne been over at the house with your grandma all day, and they just tested positive for the COVID. So uh, uh, I, think, uh, I think we all need to stand up and hold hands and, uh, and pray for your grandma. Uh, Major, uh, you, you've been busy in that church stuff. Why, why don't you get up here and say the prayer? I look at my, who's, he's now 12, but he's 9 or 10 at the time. This is the peak of COVID. I look at little Major, Major Nelson Dodge and Forth, and I go, immediately my dad says, I go, Major, take it. Have you ever heard Holy Ghost fire come through a nine-year-old's mouth? See, the son can only do what he sees the father doing. And my son, I drew the line in the sand, and I said, I'm closing all those windows. This thief doesn't have access to my house anymore because he has to have access through open window. And you got to understand, when you're watching pornography and you're doing the things you shouldn't be doing, you're opening windows to your house. And don't be surprised if your kid starts struggling with homosexuality, if your kid starts struggling with pornography, if his daddy's looking at stuff in secret because you're opening a window to your house. Thieves can't come in a house unless they get access. And this is how you close the windows. 2 Corinthians 10.4, like I just said, weapons we fight. We don't wage war like the world does. It says we don't wage war like the world does. For the weapons we have have divine power. The weapons we fight with have divine power for pulling down strongholds. Divine power. And we draw the line in the sand in Greek literature, they call it a, uh, a transformational character. That's what they call it in Greek literature. Transformational character. Someone who changed the course of the entire bloodline after him. And he went to town. He went to town praying. And at the end of that, when we said amen, my dad at 70 years old, who's... Probably not stepped foot in a church since he was a kid. Looks at me and does this. Son can only do what he sees the father doing. Of course I put my hands on my wife when, when she was throwing things at me and drunk. Of course, of course I did that. Look what was modeled for me. Those windows I never closed. The healing that I never sought. Of course that ended up coming out of me. But I ain't done anything like that since. I haven't looked at porn since 2019. I'm going through recovery, and I'm going to end this, I think, with this. So in my recovery program, it's a 15-month commitment to go through it, right? So we go through groundworks. It's 6 to 12 weeks. It's where they put everybody in to see who's serious about the recovery so they can weed out all the guys that they think will end up quitting once the going gets tough. So we go through groundworks before we get placed in a small group. And so we do that, and then we get in the group, and then each step takes a few weeks. And so we're on step three. It's the week before inventory, which I just told you all how you're going to do it. It's the week before inventory. It's first three steps are admit, believe, and trust. Admit that you're powerless to sin. Admit that you're powerless to sin on your own. Believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, and trust him to save you and deliver you from them. Admit, believe, trust. I'm on trust, the third step. I'm on trust. It's February of 2020, and I book a commercial for the Hard Rock Casino. And I go to the casino, and I'm on the third step. And I hadn't looked at porn since 2019, and I hadn't hit on any women in a bar in a long time, too. But I, I go to the casino, and I'm shooting this commercial, and, I, and, I, and I'm feeling like I think I'm somebody because I'm there, and you know, I'm in the hard rock, and uh, you know, drinks are flowing, and, you know, and the next thing I know, I'm there, and this girl comes walking towards me. 1 Peter 5 says, Be sober-minded and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. 
And I'm there, and I'm drinking, and here she comes, and I'll save you the details, but the next thing I know, this woman's in my hotel room, and I come back, and I'm ready to quit. I'm, I'm done. I'm always going to be like this. I'm done. God, I tried everything. I've been in this recovery program on the third step, and I'm the same old major, and I'm done. Why do I do the things I don't want to do? I'm quitting. When I get back to those men, I'm going to tell them what I did. I'm not going to hide it. I'm going to own it. I'm going to tell them what I did. And then I'm quitting. Instead of being told, you're going to hell, I was met with this. You ain't quitting. We love you. You might have fallen down seven times, but you're going to get back up for the eighth. We love you. You confessed it. The Bible says that we're going to pray together right now, Major. You are not identified by what you did. You made a mistake, but you're going to get back up on that horse, and you're going to start riding again. And we love you, and you're not quitting. And they're crying, and they're praying over me, and I'm crying. And in that moment, I had brothers that wanted to stand and fight with me. And I've never done it since. You may be here today, and you may be addicted to porn. You may have come to church this morning, but last night you may have been watching it. But I'm here to tell you right now that my Bible says if you get knocked down seven times, you get back up for the eighth time. My Bible says that iron sharpens iron in Proverbs 27, 17. You know why I know the Word of God? Because I can quote it like this. Not because I'm smart and because of the talent I, I got from doing acting. No, I can never memorize my Bible until I was broken and it was the only thing I could do. Because man can't live by bread alone, but by every word that come out of the mouth of God. And when I was broken and I was crying and I thought I'm ending up just like my daddy, I began to read it and read it and memorize it. And like I said before, recovery is not for everybody. This is the person that recovery is not for. I know we say recovery is for everybody. Regeneration, we say regeneration is for everybody. But this isn't who recovery is not for. If you read your Bible, if you memorize the word, and you do what it says, you don't need to be here. You don't need a recovery program. But once you close those windows, throughout the process, new habits get developed. And that's what I love about a healing and a year-long course and causing me to read something every single day. Because now, instead of going to church just on Sunday, I'm waking up in the morning and I'm doing the stuff in this book. And every one of these chapters in this book is soaked with the Word of God. And I'm reading the Word of God. And I'm memorizing the Word of God. And I'm meditating on the Word of God. First Thessalonians 5.16 says, The will of God is this. Pray without ceasing. Rejoice always. Give thanks in every circumstance, for this is the will of God for your life. And my life has been transformed because of confession, forgiveness, and amends. And you may think, I'm never going to get done. I'm never going to be able to beat porn. But I'm telling you right now, that's what the devil would want you to think. There are some windows running in the background of your operating system that need to be closed. And once you close those windows and you do that virus check and you get rid of those bugs in your system, guess what that computer begins to do? It begins to run smooth. It begins to run nice. It begins to do everything it's supposed to do. Because we know what God says. Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. I don't leave you powerless. Oh, I'm always going to be like this. My dad did this. This is just how I am. I don't leave you powerless. Repent and be baptized, and then you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's your comforter, He's a teacher, He's your best friend, He lives in you. The very fact that you woke up this morning upset because you did the same dang thing again is because the Holy Spirit lives in you. You were sealed, man. You were wrecked for eternity in a good way. And you may be in your darkest moment. It says the Holy Spirit is grieved. It says the Holy Spirit can be quenched. It doesn't say that you kick the Holy Spirit out. I don't know what you believe, but I believe once you're saved, you may far run, 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 run from God. And you may jack up your life and run back to sin and the things of this world. But there's going to be a moment in your darkest hour where there's going to be a voice when you get quiet. It's going to say, Isaiah, Brian, I'm still here. You grieve me. God gave you over to the hardening of your heart because you continue to do those things in the dark you shouldn't be doing. But I'm still here. I still love you. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. I don't tell you go take a shower and then come to me. I say, no, come here, my son. Come just as you are. 
See, the prodigal son, God didn't say, his daddy didn't say, take a shower, clean up, get perfect. He said, no, come just as you are. Man, when you begin to just love people, Jesus cleans them up on his own. Like that guy that came to my backyard and said, no, we don't pull the weeds out. We just strengthen the good grass. That's what you men need today, man. You need to start strengthening your good grass. The only way you do that is by reading the Word of God and doing what it says. And you can't do that on your own because everything in your world wants to distract you. Your job, your finances, your house, your car, your kids, it all wants to distract you. See, if the devil can't lie to you, he's going to distract you. He's going to distract you. Vanity, vanity under the sun. A chasing after the wind. A distracted Christian is a useless Christian. I ran to everything in the world to try and find satisfaction. After those kids bullied me for so long and my childhood was so broken, I made that walk. When I got bullied and beat up, and I made that two mile walk home in the cold in Indiana, when that kid said, You think we want to be your friend? We never be friends with a loser like you. I never told anybody about that until I was 40 years old. It's a window running into the background. So I thought, Okay, I found the sport of wrestling. And in wrestling, you don't have to be the fastest, the strongest. You just got to outwork everybody. And that became a God. Y'all think work hard, right? Work hard. You can be anything. Sounds good, right? But Colossians 3.23 says, whatever you work at it, work out with all your heart is working for the Lord, not for man. The world's got some catchy things to tell you, man, that sound cool, right? But if they remove Jesus, this whole secret crap, manifesting. I used to buy into that, right? Think and vision. That's what we do as wrestlers, man. If I see it and I wrestle that match the night before, I'm going to get up tomorrow and I'm going to do it. it. Makes me my own God. I'm not my own God. That's a flawed system anyway. No matter how hard I pray, I'm not going to dunk a basketball without a trampoline. But they'll tell you, you've got to think hard enough, you can do it. So I've chased wrestling. And when I was leaving that revival, and that woman said, son, you've got a calling on your life. You're going to be evangelist. And I looked at her and gave her one of these. And I'm like, dude, let's get back to Indiana quick, man. These Pentecostals are crazy. And I came back to my church. And some old lady came in my church. And she said, young man, you've got a calling on your life. You're going to be. And I said, well, that's weird. Man, this is weird. These Pentecostals are crazy. So two weeks later, I went with my buddy to the Baptist church. And I'm leaving the Baptist church. True story. I'm not making this up. An old lady grabs me. And she goes, young man, you've got a calling on your life. You're going to be an evangelist for the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm like, even the Baptist God? Really? They do this crazy stuff? Even the Baptist? So I'm here today to tell you the moral of all this. Here I am. Chased wrestling, it wasn't there. Chased acting, it wasn't there. Chased women, it wasn't there. Everything I was looking for that I wanted so much, nothing ever satisfied until I found Jesus and started living for him daily and dying to myself and picking up my cross and being with brothers. Then I got true freedom. And like Jonah, God told Jonah to go to Nineveh. Jonah ended up in the belly of a well. God told me to pursue it evangelism. I didn't know what to do with it. No men, I had no brothers, had no accountability. I didn't know what to do. I had all this stuff running in the background. Everything was keeping me away from that. And so I turned my back on it. And I went to college, and I was a good wrestler. Ended up with two torn ACLs. And then when wrestling left, I was like, well, who am I now? And I was like, oh, acting. I'll find acting. And then I chased acting. And then I got on billboards in Times Square and been on movies and dated supermodels and, and everything. I thought, as a man, this is going to fulfill me, man, because inside I'm just that broken little boy from Indiana who's told that he was nothing and he was dirt, and that's what's running my system. But really, I think that these things are going to fill me, and I'm going to be somebody if I date this girl, and if I get this house, and if I have this number in my bank account. And all I really got was, what I, uh, was a condition called destination happiness. I'll be happy when. But the peace my Jesus gives is a peace that passes all understanding. And it's not a rule book. It's not a lie. And when I begin to follow him, I can still have things in my life that I like, but even better. Psalm 37, 4 says, delight yourself and you get the, in the Lord and you get the desires of your heart. John 15, 7 says, if you remain in me and my word remains in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Right. For this is to my father's delight that you produce good fruit, good fruit, good fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. I just started preaching again. I said, I'm laying in this plane. I'm sorry, y'all. We need a revival night. I'll preach for three hours. I'm sweating like T.D. Jakes. Look at this. I need one of them sweat rags up here. 
But the moral of the story clearly is this, right? This is why I was here today. To tell you that no matter what you've done, how far you've gone, when you're called, it doesn't come with an expiration date. Your calling doesn't come with an expiration date. That sounds like a good way to sum up this message, right? It's not. What I really want you all to know is this. Wherever you go, whatever you do, make sure you stay away from old Christian ladies. I'm just kidding. (laughs) My name's Major, and I have a new life in Christ. Play Reckless Love. Can we play Reckless Love? (laughs) Can we? Let's play Reckless Love since I quoted it while I was talking. Huh? Yeah. This is my inventory book. Leave no stone uncovered. Write it all down. All of it. Thank you all for your time. I love you, dude. I love you too, bro. And I lied. I'm coming back up because I did keep, keep the song playing. I did promise an altar call. Because I believe that when something starts resonating you in the moment, that something happens when you make a physical, a physical confirmation of that thing. I believe his word does not return void. And, And something I said today, whether it be whoever that first word was about honoring your father, your mother and your father. I know God put that on my heart. That was for somebody, whether that's you or it's just you say, I'm going to draw the line in the sand today, major. I'm committed to this. And I want a new life in Christ. If that's you, come on up here today. Let's worship together. And let me pray for you. Don't let the devil lie to you. Tell you that you need to stay in your seat if you need to come up here and be prayed over. I believe that the Bible says that when any two or three come together in his name that he's there. I believe that the Holy Spirit is in this room right now. Not because it's some kind of fancy talk that took years, but because the Bible says that when we come together in his name, there is. And I believe when the Holy Spirit is present, it's thick. It's not thick for any other reason than the fact that the word went forth. It's not anything I did on my own to make somebody feel something. It's because the word of God was preached. And Jesus said, if his name be lifted up, he, not major, he will draw all men unto him. Do you agree with that? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you right now for these young men, Father God. Lord, I pray that no weapon formed against them would prosper. Lord Jesus, I pray right now, Father God, that the next time the devil tries to whisper in their ear that they need to look at that pornography, Lord, that instead they'll go to that computer and blast this song. Because Jesus, I know that you inhabit the praises of your people. And Father God, I know when your word goes forth, Father God, it's sharper than a two-edged sword, Lord God. I pray for strength, Lord God, the angels in Psalms 91:11 that have charge over these young men concerning them. Lord, I pray that they, you guard their eye gates from the things that they would look at you guard their ears from the things that they would hear anything unholy father god i pray that they would just be sick instantly father god and know that they don't need to hide sin but they need to confess it and confess it immediately love because the devil would want to trap them and make them think they need to keep it lord i went to 40 years old and i didn't tell something that happened to me at 12. no stone uncovered i pray these men expose all of it to the light in the name of jesus no weapon formed against them will prosper Lord, I pray against any spirit right now trying to come against them. I cast out any spirit right now that's impure, and I bind it up. 
I bind up any similar spirit that might try to come when this spirit gets kicked out. I rebuke you too in the name of Jesus. I say right now as a man of God with my fervent prayers, with righteousness of Christ, clothed in the righteousness of Christ, I say flee in the name of Jesus. And the only spirit that has permission right now to operate in these young men's life from this point forward is the Holy Spirit. Jesus, fill them up with your spirit. More of you, Father God. Burning in the pit of their stomach. They'd have the desire only for you, Father God. Fixed on the cross, not the stuff of the world. The world will want to lie to these young men and tell them they need to chase fame. They need to chase sports. They need to chase money. They need to chase sex, Lord. That's a lie, and I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. I rebuke that lie, Father God. There's nothing in this world that will satisfy. I've done it. I've done the things. I've tried it. And I'm here to tell them that it's nothing but pain and sorrow. And that's what it leads to, destruction. It leads to destruction, Father God. Lord God, if you say who the sun sets free shall be free indeed, Lord God. I declare these young men free from the gripping sting of pornography. I bind it up and rebuke it. I see chains falling off of them right now, Father God. I pray that this song will blast and they'll start worshiping, Father God. Because you inhabit, you say that you inhabit the praises of your people, Lord God. And I know when you're inhabiting the room that the spirit of pornography must go. The spirit of pornography must flee. It must go in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Thank you for these men, Father God. Thank you for these men. They're warriors, Lord God. I see them right now. I see Isaiah on a pulpit, Jesus. I see him preaching the gospel. Lord, I see him preaching of athletes. I see him in, with athletes, God. I see him with like pro athletes preaching the gospel, Lord. I see it. I pray they'd never be ashamed of the gospel. It'd be unashamed in every way, everywhere it goes, Lord God. Lord, I, you say seek you and you'll, we'll find you and we seek you with all of our heart. I pray today, Lord, that someone was ignited in my brother, Father God, that he would be sick of the things of the world and he'd only run after things things of you, Father God. I see him on a stage. I see him preaching on a stage, Lord God, with athletes in the room. I, I know that's a you, Lord. I see it in Jesus' name. Thank you for that vision. Father God, thank you for these young men. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thanks for your time.